Welcome. On behalf of the Cal Aggie Alumni Association, thank you for tuning in today for crafting a flawless resume. My name is Ben Wilson, and I'm the Alumni Career Services Coordinator for the Cal Aggie Alumni Association and a 2011 alumnus of UC Davis. I will be your moderator and host for today's webinar. CAAA is excited to continue to expand into the career services space, and you can look forward to more opportunities from CAAA to learn, network, and develop in your career. Throughout the session today, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions uh, by submitting them into the chat function on the right hand side of your screen. We will try to answer as many questions as possible during the event. I'd now like to introduce our presenter, an accomplished UC Davis alumna, Robin Breshwan. Robin is a certified professional resume writer and is an expert in the world of work. As a business leader with some of the largest international staffing firms, Robin has interviewed, placed, and hired thousands of people across a broad spectrum of companies, industries, and functional areas. Candidates and employers alike benefit from Robin's ability to create and manage processes that assess talent and successfully pair job seekers with opportunities. Her career tips and advice are used by U.S. News on careers, universities, national clubs and associations, and businesses. Robin is also an active junior achievement instructor, volunteer teacher, and mentor in her community. She has been honored as a Professional Businesswoman of the Year by American Business Women's Association and has served as a member of the Regents Scholarship Committee at the University of California, Davis. Robin graduated Phi Beta Kappa and as a Regents Scholar from the University of California, Davis with a degree in International Relations. She lives with her husband and three children in the San Francisco Bay Area. Robin, please take it away. All right, so um, Ben, I'm gonna do a quick test. Can you hear me okay? And if you're a participant, if you wanna enter into the chat, if for any reason you're having any listening problems. I can hear so you. So Ben, you can, yep. perfect. All right, so we'll get started. So, so thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, talking about resumes is probably one of my favorite topics, which makes me very odd. Um, it does make me a good friend to have, since most of us at one point or another are going to have to grapple with our resume in terms of getting promoted, looking for a new job, just starting our career after college, or a variety of different ways. Um, so that's what I'm going to be talking to you guys about. Um, just to add a little bit more from a background standpoint, uh, this is what I look like on the day I took that picture. But um, the work that I do takes me to a lot of interesting places because, again, everybody works in some capacity. So I'm fortunate in the fact that, you know, my writing hits a variety of people from the U.S. news standpoint. My work takes me to multiple universities, alumni associations, MBA, executive MBA programs. But then also I run a staffing company called Collegial Services. And within that line of business and those team of people, we tend to work with small to mid-sized, fast growth companies. So I get the exciting other side of career development and get to look at how companies hire, what staff they choose, how interview processes change, and so on and so forth. So today what I'm hoping to bring to you is a well-balanced look at the role that a well-written resume really does serve to help you in career progression. So I'm going to start with a little analogy first, because I think one of the most important things before we tackle resumes is to really think about how this document is used in the hiring and recruiting process. So I'm going to ask you to think, imagine you are a baker and you make unbelievable chocolate chip cookies. Everyone who's had your cookies think they're fantastic. Your friends, your family, everybody knows that this is the best. And you decide, you know what, I've been cooking for my friends and family for a while. I'm, I'm ready to do something more. And so you think, you know what, I might want to maybe start catering or doing something else. And so you happen to see an ad for someone who's getting married and they're going to interview folks for the catering and for the dessert and everything that they're going to have for their wedding. And you're thinking, a cake? I can do a cake. I make them at home all the time. Um, yeah, I'm known for my cookies, but you know, what I'm going to do is I'm going to you know, write up about how great my baking skills are. I'm going to include a sample of my cookies so someone can see how beautiful it is. Um, yeah, and I'm not at all worried. I, I can definitely do, do cakes because, you know, it's a lot of the same fundamental pieces as making cookies. So you send this, you know, written request over to the person who's interviewing and, and they get it. Now, when they receive it, one of four things can happen. And so let's talk about what those four things are. The first is 
The person might love what you wrote so much and love the cookie sample that you sent so much that they may just forsake the cake altogether. And they may say, you know what, never thought about it before, but a chocolate chip cookie as the dessert for my wedding might just be a bold and really crazy and wonderful thing to do. Now, I think all of us can probably agree here, that's probably the least likely outcome, but it could happen. The second thing that could happen is the person could infer from what you wrote. You know, gosh, baking a cookie, baking a cake, there's a lot of similarities. You know, it's having a clean kitchen, it's thinking about portion control, it's having the freshest ingredients, it's thinking about the look um, and the presentation of the cookie. And so because they've described all their skills in this area, I'm going to infer that they're probably gonna be great at baking a cake. And again, right, there's a greater probability that that might happen, but I think most of us can agree that's a pretty big leap um, from making really good cookies and having a lot of the requisite skills to you're gonna make a cake for my big day. Now, the third thing that could happen is I might see this person's name or, or the person interviewing might see my name and say, oh, you know what, I think I know someone who knows Robin and they might make some phone calls and come across somebody who knows me who says, oh my gosh, Robin, she's unbelievable. Her cookies are fantastic, but I've actually you know, been at her house when she's made cakes before. Um, and yeah, you can just show her what you need done and, and she's got it, she can, she can do it. Now with this particular outcome or this particular scenario, I think all of us would agree, huh, there is a better chance that that might happen because we've got someone in the middle giving that referral and kind of giving a testimonial about our skills so someone doesn't just have to infer. And then the fourth thing that might happen is the person ignores my request altogether and says, baking cookies is not baking a cake and there's no way I'm taking a risk here. So I use that analogy one, maybe to make you a little hungry because it's lunchtime, but more importantly, because this is what happens thousands of times a day when people send their resumes to jobs. And so my goal with this call is to help move you from thinking, ah, my job is to just explain how great I am at baking cookies and someone will infer and do the rest and help you move more toward how can I help this person better see my value as it relates to what she's asked for. So that's what we're gonna talk about. So let's talk first about what your resume is up against. So this was some data from a, um, a job board called ZipJob. So average resume, at least like in the last year, when you submit for a job, 250 other resumes are sent along with yours, right? That's a fair amount. 75% of them are rejected by some sort of applicant tracking system. And we'll talk some more about applicant tracking systems, but essentially that is the, the uh, digital or the computer platform. There's a variety of them, but many companies use them to take an applicant from submitting online to populating them in their database. And so realistically, if a company uses an applicant tracking system and your resume doesn't upload or make that journey properly, that recruiter probably never even sees your candidacy. So out of those 250 applicants, only four to six of them will be called for an interview, right? So that's a pretty small number. And if you think about it, um, this is not a holistic process. So I have a... Uh, high school student who's looking at going to college and as we toured around, you know, some of the admissions reps were very proud about saying it's a holistic process. We read every application that comes first, then we go back and then we select down the ones that we want to move forward with. Recruiting doesn't work that way. Recruiting starts with a list of candidates and if someone looks viable, they move forward and schedule that first round interview. But they don't keep going after they've filled their initial four to six slots. Um, so, so ranking or being seen as more relevant or being earlier in the process has some distinct advantages to being part of that four to six. And then finally, one person's going to get the job. So just use that to keep in mind some of the, the stats and the data that you're dealing with. And again, doesn't mean this is insurmountable, but it means there's multiple layers to thriving in this type of environment. So really, what is a modern resume? Um, you know, clearly you can see in the cartoon there, right? It's not an autobiography. Um, for many reasons, um, one of the most prevailing reasons why resumes now have to be more synced and, and kind of cut to the chase a lot faster is that average tenure in a job has declined dramatically. Nationally, it's about four years that the average employee stays at a company. Bay Area, some might argue it's more like a year to year and a half. It's probably more like two to two and a quarter. But that means that an employer needs to know what can you walk in and do today because 
statistically, you're not going to stay with me long enough for me to really train and invest in you. Um, so that's the first thing to think about. Your resume should not cover everything about your background and go back for a super long period of time. So we're going to start first with that difference between a curriculum vitae or a CV and a resume because resumes maybe five years ago or longer had more traits similar to a CV than a modern resume. So historically, whether you're writing a CV or a resume, it was considered a, a static document, right? You captured everything you had done leading up into that time. And then next, it was very detailed, right? It kind of gave you an overview of everything you did. It didn't necessarily matter if uh, it was relevant for the role or not. You just listed it. it certainly wasn't customized. Length wasn't an issue. It was chronological, so you oftentimes started with your education or your oldest and built forward. And today, the CV format's still used in academic pursuits, places where there might be a lot of PhDs, some government roles, and some international roles. Now, let's look at what a modern resume is. It's this focused, attention-maintaining document that highlights accomplishments, impact. It stays within a smaller uh, length, and we'll talk more about one or two pages. It's customized and it's relevant. And again, why does it do that? It is presenting your candidacy as to why you might be one of those four to six candidates that gets into the interview process. So just visually, you can see some differences, what a curriculum vitae might look like today versus a resume. So you can see there, it's you know, uh, we've got our education, we have um, kind of position after position or research project without a whole lot of depth versus Dr. I need a job. You can see there's, there's a summary, there's some keywords, and then even within the roles, they're broken to be clean and concise, occasional use of bold to get your eyes to go there. Um, so it just gives you a different look in terms of what modern resumes can look like. And then finally, the other piece that's come into the game before we delve into content and formatting and a variety of other things is that idea of a digital resume or digital presence. So for most of us, that's our LinkedIn profile. Now, LinkedIn, in some cases, can be very similar to your resume. So for example, how you describe your experience on your resume might also reside in the experience section of LinkedIn. Um, it's larger than a resume, so you've got greater capacity for your content. Um, you can add media, multi-dimensional aspects to it, pictures, recommendations. But the primary limitation of your LinkedIn profile and why you still need a resume is there's only one of you on LinkedIn. So you can't customize LinkedIn to suit different paths or different audiences. Um, and so, you know, as, as Ben had mentioned, we're actually going to be talking more about leveraging that power of LinkedIn in the next webinar that Ben and I with the UC Office of the President will be doing in September. Um, but that just gives you an inkling of how LinkedIn plays into the role of your resume. Okay, so now let's talk about probably the most important component of the resume, the content. And content rules meant to mean both content in terms of what are the rules around the content you use, and then also putting the emphasis on content really does rule. In other words, people hire you based on or move forward with you based on the content that you're sharing more than the format or um, you know, a variety of other sort of physical things you can do to your resume to look, look prettier. So that the content, what you've done most recently is of most interest to the audience. So before you start addressing content, first you have to think, what are you targeting? Is it a similar role to what you have right now? Or is it a transition role or a role in which you know, back to my cookie baker, there's no reason why if I'm great at baking chocolate chip cookies, I might also be great at baking a cake, but I can't be talking in chocolate chip cookie vernacular. I need to start talking about the things that would be important for baking a cake and cake decorating and the size of the cake, right? All those pieces, I need to show transferability. Um, I need to think about the business problems that I solve because, again, talking just in the terminology of my current company may not do the job. I need to talk in the, the vocabulary and the terms of the company I'm applying for. And then I need to think about things going on within that industry that I'm applying for. So as a summary of what does that all mean, it means I begin the resume with the end in mind. I'm thinking about who is the recipient and what will matter to them 
And then I use that as the lens to look at my content. So, so that's how I can help focus attention and relevancy. So now, how does that actually reside within the document? So one of the things I love for people to think about is send your resume to yourself and open it on your phone. And what you see tends to be about the top third of that document. If you have not made good use of that top third and the reader opened it on a mobile device, they probably are not moving forward. Um, and if you think about kind of where resumes used to be, gosh, you'd waste almost the top third with all this contact information and objective statements and things that didn't speak to that audience at all. So today's resumes have to get attention a lot faster. But let's assume the average recruiter is going to be looking at your resume on a, a desktop. So that top third to top half has some really important work to do for you. First of all, it has to have your contact information. And I kid you not, probably one out of every, I'd say maybe 100 to 200 resumes I get will be missing some fundamental piece of the contact information. It might be a typo in their email address or their phone number. Um, maybe they forget to put one or the other one of them on there. Um, you know, or maybe they assume, hey, because I wrote that in my cover letter, you don't need it in your resume. This is a very turnkey document. So make sure that in the top part, you've got your name and it's clear and, and easy for someone to see. You've got your phone number, you have your email address, and you have your LinkedIn URL. If you're not a LinkedIn user, you need to become one. A stat two or three years ago was that 92% of all medium to large size companies vet you on LinkedIn before they reach out to you if they get your resume. And my guess is that number almost, I'm sure it went up even more so. So again, if you, if you haven't put a presence on LinkedIn um, or you haven't spent any time on your presence in LinkedIn, you need to, and then you need to include that URL up on the top. Okay, so that's the first part. The other thing to know about that contact information, don't put it in a header because headers don't map to applicant tracking systems. That content tends to not be read, and so you need this actually in the body of the resume, even though it's up on the top, but just don't put it in a header. Next, you need some sort of summary. And summaries are gonna vary based on the amount of experience that you have, but what it does is it guides the audience for them to understand a bit about sort of the brand of you. So meaning um, it might be, it, like in my case, it could be a business entrepreneur focused on helping others to launch their career with recruiting and career coaching services, right? At least I've set the tone for, here's sort of my title or the space that I work within. I've also told you some specific things like I might be involved in professional development and recruiting. So I've given the audience some way to understand what I'm going after. Um, so, so in your summary, two, maybe three sentences. We are not fans of summaries that go much longer than that because of the fact that people won't necessarily read through all of them or they distract from other things. One of the questions I just saw, which is great, and I appreciate all of you that are sending questions as we're talking, was do you actually put your mailing address? I am not a fan of mailing addresses anymore for a couple reasons. One, there's been on and off issues where there's fake job posts out there, and so they use your sending the address, or you sending your resume to them to pull your address, and then they start sending you credit card things and various um, information that you don't want. So, so one, from a privacy and to avoid scams. And then secondly, because employers can't ask where you live, and if you're a viable and good candidate, they should just move forward. Um, I'm a fan of leaving it off as well, because there are indeed employers that I've met before that will say, no, 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 I'm only willing to hire someone who lives, you know, within 10 miles of my office. Now, their logic is sound, right? They're thinking if the commute is too long, there's a high chance that this person's going to quit. But why not let you be the judge of that versus some employer inferring that and then dismissing you and never calling you because they made that decision? Um, these days, too, it's pretty easy to get an idea of where someone lives or where they started by the area code on their cell phone, but people move all over the U.S., so I'm a fan of leaving that off. Okay, so professional summaries, we said a couple sentences long, speak to the point, and this may be something you need to customize a bit for each role that you're applying for. I have one client who works for a, a 
super fast growth cybersecurity firm. And what she will tell us is, I don't move forward with someone if the first line of their summary doesn't point to my job, meaning that, for example, she hires salespeople. So if that first line of the summary was something kind of a universal, like, you know, a, uh, uh, what, you know, a thought leader in, um, in cybersecurity seeking to add value to a growing company, she won't touch them. Versus if it says um, sales professional looking to work within a growing organization to talk about, um, you know, technologies that transform businesses. Okay, that person said, I'm after sales. So that's important there. All right, so after your summary, then you're thinking about either some core skills, core competencies, or relevant accomplishments. Um, and by the way, what we'll do after this presentation, we'll include some contact information, and you can send us an email, and we actually will have a resource list handout for you, and we'll have in-depth articles on all of these, on writing a summary, on accomplishments, on resume layout. So I love all the questions you guys are submitting um, in regards to um, some of the actual substance under this. And again, we'll give you more resources related to it at the end of the presentation. All right, so that's some in terms of how to use that prime real estate. So now next, when it comes to content, the key here, show, don't tell. And think about it, we've all had experiences of people saying, you know, oh, I love to work in busy environments, and then you see them completely frazzled when an environment gets medium busy in your estimation. Or someone who says, you know, I've got excellent detail orientation, and meanwhile you found seven typos in their resume. So whenever you actually write something that's describing yourself, such as I'm a thought leader or I'm, um, you know, I'm, I'm entrepreneurial, but then you don't show that you started any businesses, recruiters look at resumes all day long. So by nature, they don't believe you because you wrote it because unfortunately, everybody else wrote the same thing. So your job in a resume is really find ways to quantify and include information that helps to validate that you have a certain skill and isn't just you reporting or subjectively saying that that's your skill set. So quantify your success. I know sometimes two people will say, well, maybe I'm in a role where it's not like I have sales numbers. No, and you don't necessarily have to. But for example, if you typically rank high on your annual reviews, that's the way to quantify it. If you maintain customer relationships longer than people, if your company does satisfaction surveys, um, if you contribute to your team having the highest tenure in the company or having the fewest number of open recs because you're always recruiting and referring people. These are all additional ways to quantify success in roles that may not have, they may not be bound by metrics. So just think through ways that you can show and not just tell it. Um, give scope and scale. So meaning that, you know, whenever you can get a sense of if it's a very busy environment and you're in accounting, well, okay, how many things might you be processing or dealing with? How large might your team be? Um, how many people might you support? How many projects do you manage in a period of time? So again, if you can give a little bit more substance there, that's helpful. The next sentence that our bullet I have there, running implies crawling first. One of the temptations is to give this whole linear progression to get to a skill set. So if a role requires running, you don't need to put the history of when you learned how to walk and crawl and all of that. You need to focus on the running, right? So for example, if I'm applying for a, we're going to say sort of a sales manager role, then I maybe don't need to spend as much time talking about how I closed deals when I was an inside sales rep seven years ago. I need to focus more on the things that are appropriate for my level. And then even more importantly, one of the mistakes I often see, and I, you know, in our private practice, we get hired all frequently by people that are individual contributors wanting to become managers, managers wanting to become directors, directors wanting to become VPs. And one of the challenges they often face is they're talking about the best of their current level versus talking in the terminology of the level they're going after. So for example, if you're currently an individual contributor and you're applying for a managerial job where you have direct reports, don't talk to me so much about what you've done as an individual. Show me how you've influenced teams. Show me how you've mentored others. Show me how you've recruited and brought in other people. In other words, the value I'm after is the value related to the job you're applying for, not the job you have right now. So really bridge and move forward. 
whenever you can show, for example, uh, examples of loyalty, so things that show that you've got that grit and that stick to itness, that can also be as important as the actual technical skills I need. Coachability, so things you might have learned or developed. And then in all of this, be mindful of backdoor references. LinkedIn has never made it, or rather the connectivity of LinkedIn has made it so easy for very experienced people to reach out and get a backdoor reference and find out, are you really all these things that you just told me in your, in your resume? So what I mean by that is, you know, I've worked for a long time. So if someone comes and sends me a resume telling me that they've done this, that, or the other in a recruiting capacity, there's a pretty good chance I probably know someone that has worked alongside them or a manager that has been on their team or may have been at their previous company where I can call and get some insight into, are they actually as good as they say? Um, and by the way, companies do it all the time. Um, I, I hear about it very frequently that people will use backdoor references to get insight into somebody. Um, so again, be mindful of anything you're writing, you should be able to substantiate it and you should feel comfortable that someone else at the company would reinforce it if someone were to ask about it. Then finally, let's talk about customization. So most people should write a primary resume and then they should look at how to augment or match that a little better to the role they're applying for. So things such as think about why the role's interesting to you. What are the top three to five qualifications and responsibilities and how does your background line up? Um, I recently am working with a client who's a VP at a very large financial services company. She does more kind of frontline uh, client advising, so high net worth clients where she's helping them develop their financial portfolios and overseeing them. Um, she also has an MBA from Wharton, which she got about five years ago. So she's not a new grad, but certainly exceptionally talented. And so now she's interested in not being so client facing. She'd like to actually be doing more of the back office um, and the operation aspects. So she was using her client advisor resume and sending it to portfolio management, um, uh, financial services operations roles and saying, I understand why I'm not getting a hit. And so what we were able to look at is, what are these job descriptions asking for? They're not asking for meeting with clients. They're asking things about due diligence and vetting managers and running reports to see if performance aligns with expectations and looking at uh, performance indicators and metrics. And she's like, I do all that. And I said, exactly, but you were expecting them to infer. You need to spell those out because if your resume is going through an applicant tracking system and you don't have things written about some of the top qualifications, you may not even match. And you may be at the bottom of the list instead of being at the top of the list. Um, so really make sure if you look at a job description and you're thinking, hey, these are sort of the three to five things they seem to be looking for. Have I addressed my capabilities in those areas on page one of the resume? If you haven't and you have those skills, you need to do so for it to be a little bit more competitive. And again, thank you guys for submitting questions. Some of them we'll come back to in the Q&A at the end, um, but we appreciate you putting them on there. And Ben and I promised, you know, we'll, we'll address uh, most of them if the content doesn't cover it. So in short, cater to your intended audience. Um, an interesting thing, if, if you guys um, are, are interested in doing so, you can find those free word cloud generators and you can drop job descriptions in there and it'll give you the most commonly used expressions and that's a good way too to say, okay, these are things I need to make sure on my resume. All right, and then finally, anytime you're writing content, use interesting action. So not duties include, responsibilities include, that's very passive. So this is just a sample list of a range of action words. Um, but really think about, um, you know, it's not, uh, I have excellent customer service skills. Okay, yes, but everybody can say that. How about, you know, I have a high degree of customer engagement. Um, I use very qualifying questions. Um, I have a higher level of customer retention. I've got a, um, you know, just think about more of like the substance and, and what does great or good or excellent mean? What are some of the underpinnings? And use those action words because they really help someone to get a flavor of who you are. Now, let's talk about formats. Um, so first and foremost, the preferred method is what they're calling a reverse chronological resume, which means that 
you start with your current role and you go backwards. Um, so that's the standard format and it's, it's the most ideal one. And in general, most recruiters will prefer that you do the month and year of your start date and the month and year of your end date. Now, if you worked at IBM for 20 years, a recruiter is not going to care that you put you know, 1990 to 2010 as opposed to February 1990 to March of 2010. But if you worked at Dropbox, in 2018 and ZipRecruiter in 2017 and Glassdoor in 2016, they're going to want to see the months because what you've done by doing just the years, if you now scream job hopper who's not working in, working well in roles. So by doing just the years with short tenures, they're assuming you worked even shorter than a whole year. Um, so just be mindful of that. Recruiters, their number one thing they're looking for is are you in a similar title in a similar company? Because back to when we were talking about tenure is short for most employees. So the safest way to hire is someone who's doing pretty much the exact same job at the exact same company, company with maybe a little bit less or a little bit more background. That's the safest way to make a hire that can be productive. I'm not saying that's the best way, but I'm saying that's what a recruiter is paid to identify to refer to the hiring managers. So Focusing on what you've done most recently is of greatest interest to a recruiter. Now, other formats, the functional resume. Um, and again, in our resume writing practice, we get a lot of people that will either bring functional resumes to us or will say, hey, can we write a resume that shows all my skills in this area, this area, this area? And the next thing you know, their entire first page, the most important real estate is all showing or is all telling information versus actually showing. Showing shows, I did this in an actual job. Um, here were some of our results. So the challenge with a functional resume that doesn't actually show dates and when these things happen is most recruiters assume, okay, this means you don't have any relevant experience. Which again, if there's no one else who's a good candidate, that resume may be fine. Or if that is your best shot at showing relevancy is you have these skills but it's not current, then that is certainly better than not applying at all. But a reverse, a trip, uh, traditional reverse chronological resume, if you have res uh, relevant and recent experience, is going to do the best for you and the best use of your space. Now, some of the other things that can be relevant. Have you taken a class or a program or, or some sort of education on the topic? Do you have volunteer work that reinforces that you can do this? Those things are all recent and relevant and will still let you stay in that uh, reverse chronological type of layout. And then finally, when you think about formats, or actually I've got two things on more on formats, is don't make your recruiter hunt for their information. And this is one of the challenges, you know, I know there's a lot of resume writers out there who design uh, really crazy graphic resumes, and I'll get clients that will ask, you know, I run a really modern resume. And I'll say, well, what do you mean by modern? They're like, you know, really graphic that shows, you know, charts and this and that, and even if you use some of the resume templates. The challenge with this is, one, even though it all may be cramped on a page, if the recruiter can't find what they're looking for, they may not look at all. Because again, if you look at resumes all day long, if one looks like a lot of work, you put it to the side and you go look at the one that's clean. Two, it may not map to an applicant tracking system. And again, um, and, and you know, I, I, for our recruiters here, they don't look at the resume that come over for the jobs, they go into their database and they look at who's populated against that job and they work within it. Which means that if your graphic resume didn't get into the database attached to that role, no one's looking at you. So those graphic resumes, although visually they might look interesting, they usually just make it harder for recruiters to get your information. So keep it clean, simple, polished. And then think about an F pattern. So research shows that we all read documents in an F format. We scan across the top and then we drop down that left margin. So things that you wanna call out attention to following that type of pattern is very beneficial. And there's just a quote there about, you know, kind of mimics how we look at things. So the whole idea is if it gets someone to look at it and then if they see what they want, they're gonna read in a little bit more depth. All right, so deal killers and opportunity limiters. Um, so let's talk about some of the things that can just cut you out of the process altogether. 
So things to avoid. So first and foremost, there's a social psychologist uh, with Stanford. Her name is Dr. Jennifer Aker, and she's written a variety of things. But one of the things she wrote was that um, kind of the primary motivation in relationships is whether you can trust or respect the other person. And that's whether you're interviewing, meeting someone in a social setting. Um, so, so the first rule I always tell my clients is anything you choose to communicate in writing or verbally, whether it's your resume, your LinkedIn, and your interview, ask first. Does it enhance this person's ability to trust and respect me? Does it keep it the same or does it erode from it? If it, you, there's a chance that it's going to erode from someone's ability to trust or respect you, do not do it because nobody has ever hired someone once they don't respect them or don't trust them, right? You just can't come back from it. They may still hire you if you don't have 100% of the skills. Matter of fact, I'd say in this market, if you have 60 or 70% of the skills, they probably will still hire you if they trust and respect you. But when you don't trust or respect someone, it doesn't matter how qualified they are. There's a really strong chance you're not getting hired. Okay, so what does that mean? First and foremost, exaggerations. When people embellish, not only is the, the wording suspect, um, you know, when I'll get clients that are like, well, that doesn't sound grand enough. It's like, well, no, because really, for example, when um, I'll see newer to career professionals, saying, you know, they've got thought leadership. And um, again, you know, I used before, very entrepreneurial and they do transformational work. If you're 24 and you're saying these are things about yourself, that shows me how inexperienced you actually are. Because the most transformational people, the people that truly are thought leaders, they don't have to write it anywhere nor would they feel comfortable writing it, right? They are, they'll say, those grand statements are things that someone says about you, not things that you write down. Plus, those are subjective. So again, you've just opened the reader up to wanting to go, oh, are you really? Okay, let me look at sort of poking holes in that because I, um, you know, because I don't like the fact that you went to those superlatives right away. So really avoid exaggeration, speak truthfully, specifically, um, colorfully to keep interest but you don't need to you know, make something bigger than it needs to. Catch errors, and this again, you know, the carelessness, this is the, your initial step in the door. So if you don't take time to print it out, to look at it, to reveal codes and look for every space and paragraph mark, if you weren't willing to do that to audition to get into a company, I'm going to assume that your work quality is going to be significantly watered down even more once you have the job. Um, you know, it's sort of like showing up for a date and not bothering to brush your teeth or brush your hair, right? If you're not willing to even do it for the date, yeah, this is probably not boding too well for our long-term lives together. Um, so, so really check for all those errors. Some of the most common ones we see are sentences where sometimes there's a period at the end, sometimes there's not. Um, spacing, sometimes bullets are indented a certain way, sometimes they're not. Dashes within dates is usually one of the biggest ones. So sometimes it's a very small dash, sometimes you know it's, it's, it's the longer one. So just really be mindful and look for those details. The next thing to avoid, irrelevant content. Do not distract the audience with things they don't need to know. Um, again, a resume's job is to get you into an interview, not to get you hired. So we're gonna talk about length in a minute in terms of content, but don't put irrelevant things. Don't go too lengthy, and then having those difficult layouts. And then now onto the question of length. So it does depend on your level. So a one or two page resume works for almost everybody. And I work on everything from high school students to CEOs. A one to two page resume will cover most everybody because of a, a couple of things. One, if you're relatively inexperienced and you need two pages, I'm gonna question your ability to get too stuck in the details and to kind of move things up into bigger picture. Um, if you're a very senior executive and you have it on one page, I probably need to know a little bit more specifics about you um, because, you know, it's not, you can plug an executive into any role. So I want to understand a little bit more about the problems you tackle, the teams that you work with, um, the strategies that you employ so that I can get a better sense of whether our environment is going to be a good fit for you. So anywhere between one to two pages. Now, relevant, right? So again, ask yourself with all the information you have on there, if you had the most pain in the neck hiring manager reading it, and they say, why in the world did you put that you worked at Domino's Pizza on here? You need to have a reason for it. Now, your reason might be because that's how I paid my way through college, and the person owned you know, three locations, and they trusted me for four years, and I still have a good relationship, and I wanted to make sure you knew that was kind of what work, the kind of worker I was. That's great logic then it makes sense. But really ask yourself, 
does each of these serve a purpose? Consider common generalizations. So again, um, I'll use my, uh, like if I was a checker at the grocery store. So people can infer pretty much what you do as a checker at the grocery store. So you don't necessarily have to have four bullets around, I provide customer service, I take money. But add to it, such as, I worked the rush hour, I was given the keys to open the store or close out, I had to do the final reconciliation of everyone's drawers before I went home at night, right? Give me a little bit more um, to move beyond those common generalizations where you don't need to waste real estate. And then finally, if you're taking someone to page two, make it worth their time. Um, so, so sometimes people will go onto page two and it might be, so meaning they've got one full page and then maybe one paragraph on page two. That shows me you had a chance to be a little bit more brief or manage your page one a little better. So if you're gonna take me to page two, actually use page two, and then make sure page two has content that made it worth my time to get there. Now we're gonna move into the frequently asked questions, and I think this may address some of the questions that you have. Um, so scary, scary acronyms, um, or, or yeah, that, that people will come up. Um, acronyms rather. So I will get a lot of people that will email me and say, okay, I, I need a resume that uses ATS and SEO. And they have in their mind that there's some magic formula of, of dropping certain keywords that will open this, this you know, magical computer system and completely transform the process. Okay, so what is ATS? ATS stands for Applicant Tracking Systems. This is the database that companies use to intake job applications, to manage people that have applied, um, and to manage the interview process and the journey of what happens with the candidate's experience. Some applicant tracking systems you may have heard of is there's Lever, there's Greenhouse, there's Bullhorn. There's a lot of them, large and small. And again, they help to take things from, you might post on LinkedIn, and when you apply it, loads into the applicant tracking system. The recruiter comes in, they see who have, you know, who's matched to the job that they're working on and then they start calling through. So that's all ATS means. And something that's ATS ready ties back to what we were talking about earlier. Things like, is your contact information in the body of the resume and you didn't create a separate header to plug it in there? Um, things like italics. So Bullhorn, for example, if you write something in italics, when it moves into Bullhorn, anything that was written in italics comes in blurry, like it can't read it correctly. Um, if you have, you wrote kind of a table next to a table in terms of how you displayed your information, a lot of applicant tracking systems can't actually capture that information. So that's really what ATS means, is that it will play well with the particular applicant tracking systems that that company may use. Now the next one, SEO, so that's search engine optimization. That means if the applicant tracking system that's being used actually is designed to rank resumes based on certain criteria. Could be keywords, could be previous employers, um, it could be a whole host of things. So, so what that means is, again, back to what we talked about before, review these job descriptions and look to see what they're saying and talking about. So as I mentioned before, with that, that one client of mine. So for example, if she was applying for jobs that had that analytical side and due diligence was part of it, by not using the words due diligence, she may be skipped because due diligence is a very large process and they're looking for someone that actually has done some aspects of it. So make sure that you're putting in truthful keywords that are relevant to the job. If you do not have that keyword, don't drop it in there because again, you're now going to erode trust and respect. So, but if you do have that keyword and there's the description expresses a certain way, use that. Handling gaps, returning to work. So some good news on this front. Um, there was research that just came out about a, week, uh, about a week or two ago from a company called Resume Go. Um, and they found that people that had a one-year recent gap, right, so it means I showed that maybe I ended my last job in 2018, got the same, with the same qualification set, got the same response rate at people that were currently employed. So that's very good news. Now, what they found is at two years, you still were getting responses, but they were, there was a decline. Three years, you got 50% of the response rate. So it was a huge, it went from like an 8% response rate to a 4%. And then when you start moving longer than three years, it becomes less and less and less. 
Um, so just be mindful if you have taken time off for any reason, and by the way, we're all gonna work for 40 plus years, so we're all going to be taking time off at one point or another. So it's, gonna, it's becoming more and more commonplace. The fear that the hiring manager has is, are you really ready to go back to work in a full-time capacity? And are, you, are your skills relevant for you to be able to deal with the rate of change that happens when you've not been in that, their environment every day and now you're back? So if you can show things that show that um, learning ability, that nimbleness, um, you know, digital uh, dexterity, those things are, are, are what a lot of employers are nervous about if you've been out of the market for a longer period of time. So showing that you're taking classes about that, um, you know, having a good social presence on LinkedIn, showing that you're using strong digital tools, those can, those can all help to minimize the, the fear of the gaps. Um, oh, one other thing on this. Their research did find you did better if you gave a nod to why you were out of the market. So if it's just left blank, they don't know if you were fired, if you were in jail, if you had a health issue, it, you know, they don't know the reason, so they assume the worst. Versus if someone put, for example, in their cover letter, another client of mine who, um, you know, had been in technology consulting early career, took time off for her family, now was coming back. Outstanding background had done a lot of volunteer work. We were forthright about after taking time, um, you know, to, to uh, do some things outside of work, I'm now coming back into the market. Um, so that way it was addressed. And people, you know, would, would infer, okay, based on kind of her age and the amount of time she was out of the office, uh, probably was due to raising a family. Okay. Um, so, yeah, they did find by, um, you don't need to go into detail such as, uh, you know, I had this type of medical issue and, you know, my back really hurt and this, that, and the other. You don't need to do that. But you can say after taking time off for, you know, some personal or family health reasons or something like that you know, now I'm targeting opportunity or relocation or travel or going back to school, whatever it might be. Age discrimination. Yes, it does exist, but in my experience, it's less about what people think it is. People think someone just doesn't like me because I'm older than they'd expect. And, and by the way, as someone who's approaching 50, right, I'm, I'm firmly in that group. What I find more often than not, it's the distance you have from learning, relearning, and adapting in a rapidly changing digital environment. That is the greatest fear with age. And truthfully, the further away you get from that rapid learning and changing, the harder it can be to acclimate to all the things that change in, in, in a digital environment. So the best suggestion I give you, you are whatever age you are. And by the way, you know, nobody fools anybody in, in that area. So if you are genuinely overqualified for something, there's not going to be anything you're probably going to do if someone is predisposed to saying, hey, I don't want someone who's got more than five years of experience for this role. But what you can do is show that you're working on your ability to keep learning and changing. I heard a great, great quote at a conference, and it was uh, from the woman who's the chief people officer for the, uh, for, um, the Utah Jazz basketball team. And she said, we have moved from an organization of know-it-alls to now we believe we want to be an organization of learn-it-alls. And that's really what all of our mantras should be, is showing how we can keep learning and moving forward. And so I find evidence that shows you can learn and move forward will help a lot with age discrimination. Career changers. This is similar to my, you know, again, my, my lovely cookie analogy. So if you're hoping to change from one arena to another, you have the responsibility of showing how your skills will make the journey and add value in the new space. So when someone's changing careers, not only do you have to understand this other career well enough to recognize what kind of value they're looking for so that you know what to accentuate, but usually when people are changing careers, a resume rewrite alone is not enough. They usually will need to be doing networking, getting referrals, um, because there's risk. There's a lot of risk in an employer's mind of taking someone who's interested, but they're not so sure if they're qualified. So, but again, from a resume standpoint, you need to be speaking in the value and the qualification set of what you want to change to, not in your former, uh, former arena. 
and then international considerations. So when people are looking at applying for either multinational corporations or companies outside the U.S. or coming from outside the country and looking at applying at jobs for the U.S., again, you're going to have some extra homework. You have to really understand, is this an environment where they want a CV versus a resume? Um, are there certain political or international considerations? Um, you know, do you need to have certain work visa status? Um, there's a whole host of things. So make sure before you just start applying for jobs in the Netherlands, because it sounds really fascinating, that you've done your legwork and you may want to even give a nod to that in your cover letter, such as, um, you know, I'm familiar with people working in this type of environment or I've researched and I have these things already taken care of, whatever it might be. Um, those things will help, but you really need to understand what um, pieces of the process will be necessary when you're looking at opportunities outside the United States. And then volunteer work. People really, in my opinion, miss out on how much volunteer work can add value to them. So there's been research that shows whether you're paid for something or not, if you're using relevant skills, employers weigh that the same. So it means um, I had another client who um, was doing a marketing job for one company, but wanted to get in, and he was an individual contributor, so he had nobody reporting to him, but wanted to become a manager. And so he didn't have evidence of his current company of how he led people or could have, um, you know, deal with being a manager, but he had become the mayor of his particular town, and he had a board of directors that reported to him, and he ran kind of, uh, I think, Parks and Rec and a variety of things. So his volunteer work was more relevant. So when we wrote his resume, we did two different sections that let us get the volunteer work up front because managing a budget and teams of people and building consensus and interacting with the board, he was doing that and had for several years in a volunteer capacity and it was very relevant for the roles he was after. Um, the other thing too, when you think about volunteer work, don't just give yourself the title volunteer. Give, do your best to say what it was. So like in his case, again, you know, he shouldn't necessarily write um, City of Pleasant Hill volunteer, but rather mayor. Or if you're a volunteer for an auction, then have your, be the auction program manager or be the donation coordinator. Um, and I mean, you can include in there it's on a volunteer basis, that's fine. But don't give yourself a title volunteer because again, from a search engine mapping standpoint, if it's looking for a certain title or skill set, volunteer isn't going to register well there. So now in summary, because we're, we're nearing the end of our time, and thank you all for, um, you know, for staying with me on this, on this journey, the resume is only the beginning. And so the resume is important. And again, like I said, I, I, um, I love working on resumes. I know it sounds really dorky, but I just think for most people, it helps them to organize their thoughts. It helps them to connect with their value. It helps them to think about what that other party is looking for. And when they can bring all those things together, they have a much better chance of actually competing for and landing this type of opportunity. But again, the resume is just the beginning. Its goal is to get attention, to open up lines of communication, and it starts the process. But for most people, your resume also has to include, um, or is that process, networking, getting good inside information, having a good job search strategy, seeing if you can get a referral. All of those things will help support someone looking at your resume. And then, of course, when you think about experience, the challenge is experience has a shelf life. And I know it's painful because many of us can look back and, for example, if you're sitting there in your 40s or 50s, you know, it's easy to think about and say, hey, I was chairman's club and I did this, that, and the other. And then when someone says, oh, in the last three to five years, and you're like, mm, no, how about the last 15 to 20? Um, right? Would we all go, would you go to a surgeon who hasn't done surgery in 15 years? Probably not, um, because a whole lot could change in that person in the last, you know, um, 10, 15 years. Um, so really think about the shelf life of your skills and keep working on them, staying relevant, showing that you can learn and relearn and grow and adapt. Because again, that's so important for the person who's hiring you to feel like you're a safe way for them to make a hire. 
So from a question and answer standpoint, Ben, I'm going to stop because I know we don't have a lot of time. Were there any questions, um, maybe one or two, that maybe we saw several times or you want me to address before we part ways? Yeah, there are two I think we should just touch on. You've touched on them a little bit, but one was around dates on resumes, how far back to go with experience as well as um, dates, whether to put dates around degree when you obtained your degree. Ah, great questions. Okay, so let's do the degree first because that's easy. If it's not in the last four, four or five years, I would take the dates off um, because you just don't need them. And by the way, take the dates off on LinkedIn too because I think it's funny. Sometimes people will do something on their resume and then they forget to do it in tandem in LinkedIn and it, it doesn't show well in terms of your detail orientation. Um, so yeah, so, so anything more than about four years, five years, I would go ahead and take those dates off. In terms of how far back in your resume, so interesting question. For the most part, most employers want to know the last five to seven years. Stanford's rules for resume writing says no more than 10 years. The only time I encourage clients to go beyond a seven to 10 year is if they started their career in certain marquee jobs or industries that add dimension or increase their qualification set. So, but I don't necessarily handle those the same as I do in the front. So what I mean by that, let's say you started your career in the big four, and then later you moved in industry, and now you've worked your way up and, you know, a VP level. So I'm gonna spend most of the, res the resume real estate on the substance of the last five to seven years, and then I might have an other relevant experience where I will line item that you started at big four and you got up to like senior manager level or you worked on a certain, you know, um, industry set um, and put it that way. Additionally, sometimes people have really fascinating backgrounds. So my clients that have military background, I think it's important for people to see that. If you maybe started, I'm trying to think of some interesting ones, um, but, you know, sometimes people start in a totally different way, like maybe they were a consumer of a product, so they maybe they're the buyer of the product in the beginning of their career, and then later they get to become a product manager of the product. So showing that they started as a buyer of it, even if, even if we're just going to one-line it, helps to show, ooh, I've got a 360-degree view of how this product or service actually hits the market. So, so again, general rule, 7 to 10, um, but I think there's lots of opportunities where you can one line something in a different section that helps to give the reader context um, that may set your qualifications set apart. That's great. Uh, one, probably one last question because we're kind of tight on time. Uh, we have yep. some questions on how someone might get you to re review a resume. Absolutely. And so um, what I put up here, and this is probably an example of the worst slide ever, because there's, in general, we don't like to put a lot of content. This one's chock full of it. Um, so some of the things coming up, CAAA members. So if you are a member of the Cal Aggie Alumni Association, which I'm a proud member, and um, there's a lot of benefits to it, but one of them is that we do free resume reviews for anybody who's a CAAA member. Um, in addition to that, you know, we always are... Um, we do resume reviews, we do discounted services um, for, for our um, CAAA members and our webinar attendees. Uh, you'll see there Samantha T, so Samantha is our client services associate. If you email your resume review to Samantha um, or any questions or if you want to set up a consult call to learn about, you know, any of the other things that we do, um, just send her that and then we will get, you know, we'll get the information back to you. And incidentally, too, um, I think it's a three-fourths of my advising team all went to Davis. So we have lots of big fans of, of UC Davis on, within our team. Some of the other things, too, that are on there, and Ben, you, you mentioned them at the beginning, is um, the, the Meet the Career Coaches event coming up in August, which I'll be in attendance. This will be the second one that Ben and team have hosted and really great uh, networking opportunity. The Unleashing the Power of LinkedIn webinar that's going to come up in September. Um, and then in addition, anything, we do a webinars on a host, of ish, a host of topics, interview training, resumes, cover letters, you name it. So there's a link about that in events. And then also career advice articles. And, um, and as I said before, when we're done with this, if you email Samantha and let her know you'd like the resource handout, we'll send back to you a document that will have links for articles that support a tremendous amount of what I talked about. 
Um, it'll have those events on there, and then it will also link other uh, reference pieces that we used in our conversation today. Thank you, Robin. Um, I'm going to just wrap up here. Um, on behalf of the Kellogg Alumni Association, thank you for joining us today and crafting a flawless resume. It's a pleasure to connect with you virtually. Um, we are we know you are busy and we appreciate you taking the time to be a part of today's webinar. Please make sure to take a few minutes to provide feedback for us on today's event through the survey that will be coming out in the following week. Um, I'd like to thank Robin for her time, generosity, and commitment to the Cal Ivy Alumni Association. The insights and advice you shared today make me want to make sure uh, my resume is up to date. Um, as Robin mentioned, we have a few other events coming up. We hope to see you there. Uh, thank you all for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, everybody.